Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming along. Um, with us today, I think most people know Dr. Peter McGaw, Mr. Hole 001, uh, discoverer of uh, the uh, Juan Scipio vein. Uh, with us also is our uh, Director of Geology, Lyle Hansen, known as Lyle Venardus Hansen. So we have the uh, the luxury of having two geologists with uh, some degree of separation on years, which can be a good thing in terms of what happens later in life. Um, both been successful on the property, both work together very well, and I think you know, we're just starting our path of discovery at Juanacipio. Um, we have Tom Eckert up there. He's our government relations person, Mexico City based. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce everybody to a new director. We have Selma Lussenberg. Selma's joined us and um, she's going to have a hell of a ride uh, over the next few years with us at MAG. And who else from MAG here? That's it, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, this is the pointer. Okay. Forward looking statements. I don't know whether it's becoming a cliche, but we do like to stand up here and say, at MAG, we have a history of turning forward-looking statements into facts. From 2003, a new geological theory on this most prolific area in Mexico, and discovery of certainly a tier one amazing deposit, but then ensuing, you know, when we have these, when we have these presentations, we give you our new geological theories something we're going to test next. It could be a forward-looking statement. A few years later, it becomes a fact. There'll be forward-looking statements today. I'm pretty sure that some of those will become facts. Anyway, that's a long intro on the forward-looking statement side. Uh, here's the company as a snapshot. Uh, 86 and a half million shares on issue, uh, very tightly held. Uh, $95 million of cash as of the end of September. Uh, our last filed financials and uh, no debt. Uh, a wonderful list of analysts, uh, some in the room, and one guy in the far corner is going to lift that price soon, I know, and uh, very good friends of MAG, Raymond James, are just waiting for a new analyst to come in, so we've just got pending analysts up there for you guys. But uh, certainly a lot of information available for you uh, from very credible analysts in the sector. Uh, here's our uh, shareholdings, shareholdings um, our partner, Fresneo, is uh, our largest shareholder, but you can also see there a list of you know, significant precious metal specialist funds. A lot of them have been in the story for a long time, and uh, they certainly see the, uh, the potential in owning MAG now and getting in early. We're starting to transition now into production, and I hope everyone's going to get a nice little re-rating here over the next 12, 18 months. We've been around since 2003, focused on high IRR projects. Not necessarily high grade, but that usually gives you high IRR. But we look at other things. We look, it has to be district scale, right? It has to have recoverable metals in it. Um, it has to be in a reasonable jurisdiction. So Mexico, silver, generally comes with other metals, and we have all those. We could even add copper to that slide. Um, Juan Ocipio, our most advanced project which we uh, partner with Fresnia PLC, world's largest primary silver producer. Uh, they, they own 56% and are the operator. Uh, 2005, they uh, started to earn in on the project uh, on a joint venture basis and, uh, and become the operator. And that's boded well for MAG uh, in terms of having you know, someone on the ground there very competent to build this asset out. Uh, one of the most important things, I think, Peter's going to talk geology later on, and you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about we're building this now, and you're going to see the progress and you know, immense cash flows coming out and great metal flows, all that sort of stuff. The Juan Ocipio project is still very, very much an exploration story. Right? We've only drilled 5% of the surface of the property. We haven't even drilled some of our high priority targets yet, but that's changing. You know, both partners now are very committed to the exploration of the property. Under, you know, the, the discovery of the north-south veins, thank you, Lyle, uh, ably abetted by Peter, um, has really opened up the thinking that there's probably significant more 
veins to be discovered on the joint venture ground and not all running in the 500 year historical east-west orientation. So this is where we are in the Fresnia district, unique, uh, probably the preeminent silver district in the world. Uh, one of every 10 ounces of silver on the planet comes from this area. You can see the joint venture ground there in the purple, or blue, what's it look like up there? Uh, and we're uh, surrounded by um, Fresnia. We're going to zoom, and here, here on the, uh, this corner here, you see the litany of forward-looking statements being turned into facts. That list will get bigger. We zoom in on the joint venture ground. Here's the blue. You can see in here where we purchased, back in 2004, 2005, we purchased the surface access rights from the local Ojedo, and that was the footprint of the project. In 2012, we'd done a PEA based on what was the Bonanza zone. You're going to see that come through in a minute. And we had a 2,700 tonne per day plant uh, contained within the hills of this area. In 2015, we put four sterilisation holes underneath that Bonanza zone because we wanted to move on to greener pastures. Um, and we didn't have a lot of success sterilising the Val de Carnes vein. We actually found more of it. We found it a lot thicker and we found it was some very outstanding base metal grades and, importantly, much higher silver grades than ever expected at depth. And then as we continued to drill, we found more and more veins next to Baldacanes. So very quickly, and Fresnia as the operator were very smart and moved very quickly, um, just based on those four holes, we did some trade-off studies and we upsized the project from 2,700 tonnes per day to 4,000. We put crushes underground, we're conveying the rock out, we're going to put an internal shaft in. Now we're starting to think about this is perhaps bigger than just one processing facility. It's very smart when you're starting to build your underground to oversize it on day one. And that's what's happening. Now part of that meant we needed more ground and we probably needed flat ground. So up to the north of the joint venture area, you can see all these bean fields. The joint venture has purchased all those farms. We own it fee simple and that's where the tailings facility and the uh, process plant is going to go. But this sort of gives you a bit of a snapshot about just how unique this wonderful world-class asset is positioned. Right, people have been mining silver here since 1552. Fresnia themselves have been in this area for over 130 years. And Fresnia have built what was previously the world's largest silver producer, the Fresnia mine, the current world's largest silver producer, Sacito, and the future world's largest silver producer, Juanacipio, all in their backyard. So it's a very de-risk development process for mag silver in this asset. It's a point where a lot of companies, successful ex exploration companies, tend to falter when they go from being an exploration company to a developing producing company. And for those people who know my history, you've seen me live through that uh, previously. So a wonderful place, um, the right partner to be building this out, and uh, we're going to show you the progress we're making. So here's our resource statement, which, com which was the foundation for our um, 2017 PEA. It's the 4,000 tonne per day, it's the larger PEA, it's got the internal shaft in the, down to that inferred category down deep. And we uh, actually classify it out in the Bonanza zone with typically high grade silver, good gold, lower base metals than you have at depth. Um, and then the, the deep zone, lower silver, but still pretty respectable. I mean, the average silver grade in the industry is about 150 grams per tonne. So our low grade deep silver is actually above. Um, as I said, this is 2017. There's been two extensive drill programs on the property since then. And today, Fresneo um, released an updated resource. Because of the laws of 43101, I can't tell you what the numbers are, but I do um, encourage you to have a look at that. Uh, you'll see that these numbers are now getting a little dated. And um, 
it, it's quite surprising, really, the way this resource is growing. And you saw our press release today uh, of last year's infill program, and there's some quite outstanding intercepts in that. And I think it's worthwhile pointing out to you that um, you know, Fresneo completed or well, were conducting their resource statement. They have a cutoff date for when they have to stop drilling, take the data, and calculate the resources to release today. They actually release reserves and resources today. The standout in our press release is a hole called D5 daughter 12, D5-12, which is an outstanding hole. There were two other holes around D5-12 that are also outstanding in terms of timing. Those three holes didn't make the Fresneo cutoff. And so they're very influential because the grades are so significant and the widths are so respectable and they're not in the updated resource of Fresneo. So when you look at that, take it as, it could even be on the conservative side. So this shows um, a cross section, a long section uh, of the Val de Cunha system. Here you see the two portals that surface, they're in the video. Uh, we've got about 25 kilometres, a bit over 25 kilometres of development down here now. Here's the rock. You're going to show pictures here. In fact, I'm going to pass this around. I want it back because it's... This is off... Um, don't worry, it's got a microchip in it. I know it's going to take it, all right. Um, this is off the stockpile that's sitting on surface at the moment. Right, we've got a considerable amount of tonnes sitting on the surface. Um, this is typical of what you get in Upper Val de Cunhas. It's probably three or 4,000 grams per tonne of silver. So we're down here now taking rock samples. We've got about 10 or 12 cross cuts through, through Val de Cunhas. We're very comfortable with what we see in reality versus what the model says, which is always good to confirm in an underground situation. I mean, you drill from surface, you develop for a few years, you want to make sure the ore body's there. Luckily, this mineralisation is there. And we've found additional stuff, right? Uh, as we've developed across the top of Val de Cunhas, we start to hit some structures running the other way, the north-south. And they are not in any resource model. But we mine 25 metres either side of the ramp, leave that material for later on, but it can add handsomely to the early tonnage of very high grade that we'll pull out. And then over to the side here, I'll talk about this in the video as well, here's the Bonanza zone, here's the deep zone discovered in 2015 but continuing to grow with drilling. And then of course as we step out wider to get an appropriate angle to hit even deeper because it's open at depth, it's open to the sides, by accident we found two other veins, anticipata and pre-anticipata, obviously named by the Mexican, geolo Mexican geologist down there. Here's a good intercept. I wonder what that is. In anticipation of a vein, we'll call it anticipata. And so this year, for the first time, we've decided as partners to go and do a concerted exploration program to just see what's the extent of anticipata and pre-anticipata because we believe that there's a good chance that these are going to grow. And it's fantastic for mining, because you've got Val de Cunhas, which six metres wide average width through the middle of this, it goes out to 30 metres wide. But then 80 metres away, you've got anticipata. 120 metres away, you've got pre-anticipata. So this is a godsend for an underground miner. You're not down there just mining that one vein, which you do see a lot of that in the Fresneo trend, right? The veins are incredibly long, but they are discrete, one mineralised boiling zone. Here we've got a suite of these. So when we're underground, we're not going to encounter a lot of issues that people get on single vein mining when you, st you fall behind in development and you can't feed the mill, those sort of things. We've got so many options here, let alone the stuff running the other way that goes through the mineralisation. There's no development to open up those faces, it's just a stope. So incredible mining flexibility. There's Don Pedro kissing Val de Cunhas back in uh, February of this year. And um, we're down there now, we're starting to sink three of these sub-ramps 
through the mineralisation so we'd, we can mine the complete strike length. That'll give us a maximum mining rate. Currently, I think it's about 5,500 tonnes per day is the sustainable mining rate here, should we want to push it that hard, uh, from just uh, uh, mining the uh, Bonanza zone. And this is the schedule we announced last week, an update to the schedule. Um, yeah, we've finished the decline. We've been down there at the mineralisation since the end of 2018. Ventilation, underground infrastructure is still ongoing and we're going to actually be in commercial production of the mine underground in June. That's that is development uh, material, development mineralisation. It's a significant amount of tonnage and it is enhanced by these north-south structures that we've hit. And in October, we actually open up the first stope. And so, you know, you'll see released today by Fresneo some numbers on the tonnage. That is development only. There's stope tonnage from October, which will come on top of that. So there's going to be a significant amount of that nice stuff that's getting passed around the room mined here during the second half of this year. To enable that mine to really come up fast and come up hard, we brought forward two ventilation shafts from sustaining capital. So our previous, previously released capital number, <coughs> excuse me, was $395 million. Uh, that was as of um, the announcement of the go-ahead decision in April of last year. Bringing that $40 million vent shafts in kicked that up to be 440. So it's not like additional capital for the development of the project. It's coming out of the sustaining bucket and going into the initial capex bucket. So we're now looking at from um, the, the zero baseline for the capital is the 1st of February 2018. We're looking at a total now of $440 million. Now the plant is taking, the construction of the plant has been staged to enable all the equipment to come on site. A lot of the foundations, the structural steel is all prefabbed in quality control conditions in workshops and it's going to start coming out the site now. Right? We believe, we initially indicated that we'll finish the plant at the end of 2020 and we'll start commissioning here. We think now it's, it's more prudent to guide, we're going to finish the plant early in 21, commence commissioning say in the first quarter and then be ready to come up uh, by middle of next year. So commissioning in the first half of the year rather than say the first quarter of the year. So this just shows you the ramp. All the ramp underground is five by five. Uh, looks pretty good, They're built to last for sure. The ramp's fully bolted, shock created, concrete floor. Um, this is why they get such great operating costs as the operators. A picture of the portals and um, some workshop, uh, permanent workshop and underground support infrastructure buildings are going in there now. Uh, as Michael indicated, here's the uh, ball and sag mill. Uh, they arrived on site a few weeks ago ahead of any coronavirus interruptions to supply chain, uh, which is good. Uh, here's the flotation plant, almost complete, sitting on the ground, ready to get bolted in. So what you're going to see there is like this plant's going to grow like a weed, right? There isn't going to be a whole bunch of contractors pouring concrete and waiting 30 days for it to cure. That's all done. You'll see contractors starting this week digging holes and then the concrete comes up, plonked into the ground, nice and gently plonked, and then um, the structural steel comes and bolts onto it. All the pipe work's pre-spooled, it comes and bolts onto the structure and off we go. So it's, it's going to move very quickly now. Uh, this is the overall a view of the site. Uh, there's the mills down there, there's the portal of the conveyor, uh, here's all the flotation plant, site offices, infrastructure uh, starting to go in now. There's um, six foot four, six foot two guys standing in front of Val de Carnes. so uh, beautiful thing to mine as you can see. And here's the video. Just click forward. Or do you? All right, so here we are zooming in the joint venture ground, the outline shown in blue. You can see the uh, two portals here. Uh, first one commenced October 2013. Second one put into upsize for the 4,000 tonnes per day. 
There's a section of Valdecones now on a uh, NSR heat map, as you can see, very high value rock, even deep, which is uncharacteristic of the, uh, of the Fresnia system. They're usually very silver rich at the top, more base metal dominant at the bottom, but Peter will talk about his stacked boiling zone theory. Every hole we drill down there is, is, re is reaffirming that. Um, and then as we spin this around, you're going to see just the, the mining flexibility you get with anticipata and pre-anticipata, and then we've even stopped talking about the one Scipio vein, which is a few kilometres away and it runs multiple kilos per tonne. There's the Venardis coming through, and um, here we are now starting to pull out nice high-grade material that we're going to start to realise cash flow from from December, oh, so from December, from uh, June of this year. So for all those people who have been with us for a long time and been waiting for this, we're there, we're getting there. And uh, our CFO's not here, but uh, he's going to have to get those uh, spreadsheets doctored up to take the uh, cell address cash flow. So we can't wait for that. And of course, very important, now we're still building and finishing the expenditure for the process plant. So the cash flow we're going to get from the sale of the material to Fresneo is going to offset capital needs for us. We also get into a situation where you know, we're actually going to run the material through a identical flow sheet for six or eight months, live plant scale operations. So when we start up on the one Scipio plant, it's going to be very de-risked. And that's where you've seen the operator has revised guidance. You know, in um, April of last year, or well, even um, on, on, on Fresnillo's capital markets day in December of last year, they announced the first year of a 65% ramp up. Well, they're only going to do 65% of the tonnes. Now that's 80 to 85%. And uh, so I think we're going to hit full run rate on this very quickly. A lot of that is because we would have de-risked the metallurgical response of Juan Ascipio in the Fresneo mill. So again, it just that map that shows Fresneo and where the joint venture is, just the, the, the advantage of having Fresneo as a partner and being in that district means a lot to MAG, a lot of value creation by bringing this underground mine on early and generating cash flow before you've even finished building the plant. I've built a few mines, I've never seen that before. It's a good situation to be in. That was in case the video didn't work. I'd have to talk to that for a long time. So I'm going to hand over now to Peter, and he'll take you through the geology. And like a good geologist, I'm sure he's going to give you a forward-looking statement or two. There you go, mate. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for being here. And thank you, George, for everything except what I think was sort of a left-handed dig about my being old. <laughs> Comparison to Lyle, anyway. Um, so, uh, wise. Wise. Uh, okay, that, that that's a good euphemism for being old, I guess. Okay, so in in 2018, um, actually a year ago, we started talking about the discovery of the northeast trending vein, sometimes called north south for for simplicity, uh, and. The first one we found was the Venatus vein. Lyle had noticed quite some time before that there were a number of intercepts of holes, oblique intercepts made in holes that were headed to the Valdecanius vein that didn't make any sense and they didn't line up on a parallel structure to the, to the Valdecanius vein. He realized they did line up on a northeast plane and uh, we got a little, you know, we, 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 we talked about this for several years before we actually got to one of these things and actually hit it in the decline, the conveyor ramp uh, that we're digging, and then we've drilled a couple of holes at it directly. So the discovery that we announced this morning was that since last year we have found two more of these veins, both through drilling and through direct heading. And so here we have the, uh, no, 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 there's, there, there's Valdecanias, Venatus II, and actually over here is what we're calling the Valentina vein. Um, these, these veins appear, the, we, we can now see them underground. We can see that they cut the Valdecanias vein, uh, and the mineralization appears to get 
thicker where these intersect the Valdicanius vein, here, here, and here. And quite interestingly, the gold grades go up where these veins cross the Valdicanius vein. So they're late intramineral. They seem to be intimately related to the late stage of introduction of gold. Um, so these are important for a combination of reasons. As George mentioned, these are right in the developing mine infrastructure, so mineralization in them will be very easy to add to what we're pulling out of the mine. But what's more important to me as the exploration guy is for a long time, I've been fascinated by a parallel structure called Sesantoni at the northeast corner of the property. Sesantoni has the same direction, has very strong alteration on the surface. In fact, one of the puzzling things about Sesantoni is the alteration here is more, is better developed than any of the alteration that we see on top of the Valdicanius vein. And you know, we've only explored 5% of the property, this little blue area up here. But we, you know, there's a number of additional structures like this that we want to understand. So we've also recently learned as attention has turned to Sesantoni because of demonstrating that these Northeasters actually have mineralization in them. The people who said before, well, yeah, we see the alteration, that's nice, but the orientation's wrong, are now going, okay, we can look at this orientation and take it seriously. We now recognize that it's not just kaolinite, but it's illite as well, and that's fancy geo speak for saying, here higher temperature, more proximal, more mineralization related clay minerals associated with the alteration there. So it makes it even more favorable than we thought before. And I'm gonna explain how this fits into our district scale thinking here in a second. Going back to the Valdicanius vein, again, we talked about how uh, where those three northeast trending veins come through, the gold goes up. But focus on silver showing the high grade up in the Bonanza zone, transitioning to higher lead grades at depth, more <coughs> zinc coming in below that, and ultimately copper coming in very strongly here at the bottom. Uh, this is a classic vertical zonation that you would expect to see in one of these, except for the fact that silver comes, comes in strong down here again at depth. And I should point out that one of the holes that we announced today, which as George mentioned is not, it, it was, was finished after the cutoff date for the resource recalculation sits right in here. And that hole was 5.8 meters that ran 3.8 kilograms silver. That's 113 ounces silver with a quarter of an ounce of gold, plus 19% combined lead zinc, plus 0.3 copper. Uh, by anybody's standards, that's a barn burner hole, and it's remarkably deep in this system. So to see those kinds of silver grades uh, at, deep, at depth is again showing us that it appears we've got stacked boiling going on in the system. So this is just more evidence that the Valdicanius vein saw a lot of action. And when we put that together with a funnel-shaped scarn zone that comes in at depth, high copper, high boron. This zone sits right on top of where the Valdicanius vein intersects, excuse me, the Venatus vein hits the Valdicanius vein. It's telling us that we have an ore fluid upwelling point. And that's important for a number of reasons, but last year when Fresneo did their field, uh, field report or, or field visit, they released the first long section we've seen of the entire Valdicanius slash Harias vein, and they had this piece cut out, but you can see the western piece here. Here's, here's Valdicanius, here's the Juan Escipio project where the mineralization is coming in strong from our interpreted up, upwelling point here, diminishes off to the west, diminishes off to the east as well. Uh, really reinforces the idea that this is where 
the ore fluids came from right here. And when you put all this together with what's driving that, you've probably got a magma body down here that's driving these fluids to rise in this, in this, in this way. They come up as a convection current. They go to the west. They go to the east. We don't understand why it's asymmetrical, but that seems to be real. And we also note that in a number of places down in here, some of the Fresneo drilling is deeper than ours. And there's gaps between where we have mineralization and where they have mineralization. So those are areas that we definitely want to see explored. And that will be tapped by this program George was talking about in terms of going after anticipata and pre-anticipata because they sit right down in this area right here. So now I'm really going to start talking forward looking statements. So we have what appears to have all the ingredients of an ore fluid upwelling point. The first question is, is this unique in the district? And the answer is no. That actually there's one that was identified in the district historically. The historic district mined from the surface for 1,200 meters down into a, an identical SCARN zone with high boron, high lead zinc values, not much copper, and no gold. And one of the things that had puzzled several of us for a long time was how do you explain the zonation of this giant district with respect to an ore fluid upwelling point here? And this is, was a conceptual roadblock. And now that we recognize we have another one, we no longer have to explain how fluids got from an upwelling point across structural grain to a much better looking proximal mineral metal assemblage with copper and gold, which is what you'd expect to see in an upwelling point. So it's telling us, okay, we've got two upwelling points, they're different. They have a different metal budget. They're both related to intrusive rocks. We're actually starting to see some rhyolites coming in in some of the deep holes here, which is what we expect to see. But it's telling us we've got different upwellings and they look a little different from each other. So then we back off and we go, well, there's six kilometers between those two. What, what happens if we move six kilometers in another direction? We go six kilometers to the west, we come to Sesantoni. Maybe the reason why Sesantoni has a different orientation and stronger alteration is that there's another upwelling point there. We come six kilometers to the south. We're right on the projection of the Wisache vein, which was found out here in the flats, and Fresneo has tracked it to the west towards the joint venture ground. Suggests there's another hot spot here. Potentially, there's another big vein here. Another six kilometers to the south, we have the Triumpho area, where we see structures with the same northwest trend, very strong alteration on the surface, absolutely no exploration. Someone's phone is charged. Okay, that's all right. I, I like a little musical interlude. That's not a problem. So, and when you look at all of these, and another one down here, there's an old small mining district down in, in this area. In the center of all of this, you have a long-lived multi-stage volcanic center, and these things are clustering around it so you've got a giant, long-lived heat source, local convection centers related to upwelling zones and mineralization associated with them. If you can identify where these upwelling points are, that's probably where you're going to have the biggest veins in each of these areas. I mean, we already know there's a big vein associated with this one. There's a big vein associated with the one up in the historic part of the district. If you can find the big veins first, then you can get some serious tonnage and grade in one of those and work outward from those into the incrementally smaller veins that probably exist. In fact, we know they exist because they found a bunch of them out here to the, to the east that lie between these things. So you can give yourself a big anchor for future development along with a lot of potential for developing smaller veins in between. So that is my revised vision of how I would like to see uh, the Fresneo district and especially the Juan Escipio area explored over the next several years as we go forward. As we're putting this thing into 
high-grade district scale production. Uh, we've got a nice balance sheet. We expect to be sending ore to the mill next door by mid-year. We'll have our own plant online fully running by mid-2021. And the part that I care about the most, well, I shouldn't say that because I really care about producing, all, you know, making this the world's biggest silver mine. I, uh, uh, 25 years ago, I set foot on the property for the first time. So it's been a long time coming. I'm eager for that to happen. But I am eager to keep finding more. Valdecanias vein is going to keep growing. To, it's open to depth in both directions. The Valdecanias vein, north-south uh, structures, not just in the, in the Venatus area, but at Sessantoni, I think are going to give us some significant exploration potential. And I think chasing this upwelling fluid model uh, throughout the district has the potential to give us even more. Um, and as George mentioned, um, our directors and officers have been augmented recently by the addition of Selma Lussenberg, who is here with us today. I just had the pleasure of meeting her for the first time, although we've chatted on the phone before. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. George and I will field any questions you may have.